Thank you very much, everyone. And as you can see the title, I want to talk about sustainable transportation, airships versus cargo jets. Uh, I've talked a lot about northern transportation, and people know me for that, but this is maybe a little bit different topic, and I thought perhaps for this audience it would be more interesting because you have more interest in uh, aviation in general and, and fixed-wing aircraft. So uh, this uh, picture presents a really interesting division of the 20th century technology. Uh, what we see on the one side is the pinnacle of airship technology. Uh, the, the Hindenburg was perhaps the, the most uh, successful. There was one after this, but never really flew very much. But the Hindenburg was sort of the peak of the airship development uh, prior to the Second World War. And the Comet was the very first jet airliner that appeared after the war. So this uh, great divide came about uh, what's interesting is, of course, that the comet set off what was essentially the jet age. And it was a, a product of the war, and it literally devoured all the competition. Uh, the reason for that is multiple. Uh, the first is, of course, that uh, oil was cheap. Uh, it could travel above the weather. No need for those sickness bags anymore. Uh, much lower maintenance on turbine engines, so there are a lot of developments there. But of course, also, it was fast. And the desire for speed is something that really characterized, I think, the jet age. I remember reading an article that said that if a comet, and I guess it was a DC-6, was the sort of the equivalent cutting edge of the, of the piston engines at that time, had left London for Johannesburg at the same time, the comet would have met that airplane halfway on its way down. So it was just that much faster. And of course, uh, it led to lower fares. It kicked off the whole tourist industry. I would say even globalization. Without jet aircraft, that would have been a, a lot harder to have achieved. And of course, at the very bottom, as you see, nobody cared about air pollution. That wasn't even a thought at that time. So the down below, or <laughs> down below to me, uh, on the screen, you can see the notion of a time path for technology development and the tipping point. Uh, the airships never actually got to the tipping point, in my view. Uh, they got very close, and they would have made it. You know, Second World War hadn't come along. It would be a very different picture today. But they didn't. Uh, the flying boats got past. The, the piston planes got by. They were actually on the rise uh, before the comet came along, and then everything changed. So it wasn't just the airships that disappeared because of competition. It was transcontinental trains, the ocean liners, flying boats, everything disappeared at that time. And you know, it's interesting uh, to note the luxury of the travel uh, disappeared at the same time. Even the flying boats were very big and, and luxurious. Uh, we went to something uh, much different afterwards. There is a cloud around the silver lining. Uh, this is a wonderful picture, which I know it's not really representative. They were pumping water into the jets to give them more thrust so they can get off. So we don't see that kind of carbon, except the, I guess it's the B-52s uh, were still uh, do that. Uh, we're down to about a third of the fuel that they use at this time. We just can't see it anymore, but it's still a lot of fumes coming out of the bottom of that airplane when it takes off. There's a study that was done in uh, 2014 that looked at all the types of innovations that could come about for airplanes and how that would reduce uh, carbon emissions or at least uh, you know, improve things. Uh, they observed that there's a lot of things that can still be done. Engines could be made more efficient. Wings could be made more efficient. Uh, the equipment could be made lighter and so on. But it doesn't matter because the uptake in demand is such as going to overwhelm all that. We're all still going to see a lot more carbon emissions from air. You can see the, the top diagram shows the Comet at 100. We're down to about 30% uh, of the fuel that the Comet used. But as you can see, it also hasn't changed very much in the last several years. So it, we're not going to see a lot more gains there, I don't believe. What I want to talk about the most is air cargo and jet cargo uh, planes. Uh, you can see from this diagram, uh, there's a lot of product 
that's moved between uh, Europe, Asia, and North America uh, via these uh, cargo jets, a, a very large amount. And of course, in terms of value, it's, it's really quite remarkable. This is for the US only. But if you look at the amount of trade that's moved by air, it's equal almost to the amount by water. Uh, of course, it's only a teeny tiny amount by weight, but of course, if you're moving things that are worth their weight in gold, like computer chips, it adds up pretty quick. So it's really important in terms of our economy, uh, movements of things by air, uh, even if the, the quantities themselves are not that large. The emissions are, and uh, this is a, a game from the US, uh, obviously that big blue spot is road transport, automobiles and trucks, uh, the biggest part of that emissions. But it's interesting to note that the green part, which is air, of 10.7% is literally equal to, or, or more than, uh, what you see by uh, rail and by water. So there's a, a huge amount of emissions that come from air, and, and this, of course, is a target, and we can see why, you know, in terms of the amount of, of carbon emissions per uh, mile that, or ton mile that we get for the different modes of transport. Air stands out as being three times trucking, or five times trucking, sorry. My math isn't that good these days. Well, there's, how do we get around this? One of those is to look at the so-called sustainable aviation fuels, and this diagram kind of points to what you could do. Uh, we have in Western Canada, uh, right this year, two large canola crushing plants that are being completed to build, to crush canola seed, to get oil, to make aviation fuel. And the presumption is that this is going to be less emissions. Well, I'm not sure if that's true, or but it's certainly not enough. You can see that chart on the other side looking at what's the growth rate and the demand for these SAFs. Uh, it really comes down to what price. And I haven't seen anything that's anything less than three times the cost of kerosene. Um, sometimes it's more. There's certain divisions of, of doing things differently, and maybe we will. But I think in the meantime, we're going to see uh, more costs in terms of, of aviation. <coughs> We've talked at this conference about hydrogen and the possibility of using new types of aircraft like this Airbus uh, concept. I like this one best, uh, mainly because it's got a lot of space to put the hydrogen in the, in the uh, fuselage. I think this is probably the way we're going to go with that. But as you're carrying more cargo and, sorry, more fuel in terms of, of just space, uh, how much cargo do you put on these vehicles? And the passenger airlines account for about 50% of all the air cargo in the belly space. So again, if we move this direction, it's not clear to me that we're going to have the same ability to move cargo even by the passenger uh, jets. In the case of the cargo jets, well, this is a numbers from uh, FedEx and UPS. And what we can see is the average age of their air fleet is 20 years. So even if in 2035 they start getting hydrogen airplanes, the cargo business might not get those for another whatever number of years beyond that. Uh, they're going to be using older airplanes and very polluting for a long time to come. And, and this is a really interesting part of the aviation industry. Uh, why are we doing this? And, and of course, uh, what we know is most of these airplanes are converted from pasture airplanes. The airplanes get old, maintenance is high, switch them over to a cargo mode, put in a heavy floor, block out the windows and put in a door and bingo, you've got a cargo jet. Um, because they aren't as valuable, that's very good because they don't get many hours. Compared to passenger jets, they wouldn't get half the hours in the air. So using cargo jets, old passengers, that makes a lot of sense. It also provides a market, an aftermarket for the passenger market. So I'm sure that the, the airlines like this, they, they get something for their, their older jets when they retire them. And, uh, and of course, there's a whole industry, as you can see, with 23,000 new employees since the pandemic started was the number here for converting uh, these airplanes. Well, during the pandemic, everything got messed up. We know that, tremendously messed up. And uh, they said that there was enough 
cargo uh, in the form of containers floating off of Los Angeles, that if you took all the boxes up and just put them end to end, they'd reach halfway across the US. That's how much uh, clogged up the, the system was. So people were using air freight a lot just because they had no other choice as well. I wouldn't be much of an economist if I didn't have at least one confusing diagram. So here it is for you. <clears throat> this is a diagram of joint products. And air freight in passenger mode is a joint product. You have passengers in the upper part and you have the belly space for the cargo. And the cargo yields about maybe 15% of the total revenues uh, for the airlines. Uh, so where you have a certain supply of aircraft and where that cuts, the prices get determined and, and basically uh, that's how we, we market uh, the, the cargo. Of course, there isn't enough. So that's where the dedicated jets come in. So the dedicated cargo jets are really, a, their number is a function of how many passenger jets are and what the capacity is because they're sort of the overflow. Downside for the cargo jets is that their prices are determined by the belly space generally in the passenger jets. So they have to live with a, a byproduct mark, which is not very much fun if you're in that business, I think. Well, what happened during the pandemic? It really was a, a very unusual circumstance. First of all, less flights. You know, flights were canceled to China, amongst other places. That was a big uh, uh, cargo move across the Pacific. So there was less demand for, for flights. Uh, and we also had more demand for cargo because of the block with the ports and, and logistics for things coming in. Uh, and we also had a reduction in the number of airplanes because a lot of the airlines were letting the leases run out and returning airplanes and, and reducing their fleet because they, they didn't need them. So we suddenly had a lot less capacity to move cargo, which set off a boom in the demand for cargo jets. So we saw this tremendous increase going about happening at that time. These are just a few of the articles that are out there. Uh, suddenly Air Canada was back in the cargo business, then Qantas is in the cargo business, and Lufthansa was expanding what it was doing in 2021. Lots of activity. And in 2022, more uh, cargo. You can see one being uh, changed there into a, having a door, and Ethiopian Airlines, and, and some I even not heard of. I've never heard of flight services, but there you are. New airlines popping up to move cargo. So a real boom came about in the cargo industry. And then, of course, we had the bust. Um, Global Western being one that's just filed for bankruptcy recently. Uh, others that are delaying airplanes coming in and so on because it is a, a boom and bust. It was a very unusual period. But once those passenger airplanes are converted to cargo, they're not coming back. It's the old clay to China, but you can't go China back to clay. So as a result, they're going to be there, and they'll probably get used uh, for some time to come to the maybe regret of the, uh, of the uh, environment. This is what it looks like in the future, at least projections by Boeing and, and some others, is that we have about uh, what, a little over 2,000 cargo jets today, and this is going up to about 3,500 cargo jets. Uh, some will be retained, and this is by 2040, so there's going to be 20-year-old airplanes on top of how old they are now going in, still flying. And there are some 40-year-old airplanes out there flying cargo. It's quite interesting. Of course, the replacements, a lot of those will be conversions. They won't be brand new cargo jets and so on and add some growth. Well, one of the solutions is why not use airships to move cargo? Unlike passengers, cargo doesn't complain. And it doesn't have to get there that fast. If, if you look at you know, the movements of cargo, uh, truck speeds, that's actually really fast. Uh, the average speed of the railway in North America hasn't changed in 100 years. It's roughly 26 miles per hour. That's the system average of, of the railways. So you don't have to move that fast for freight. And airships are pretty fast, um, about 145 kilometers an hour, or 80 miles an hour for those who, uh, who wish. Um, so it's about a fifth of the speed of a jet, roughly. Uh, and it also has some advantages. Now this is a, a comment that came out from IATA and sort of put the cat amongst the pigeons. Uh, nobody wanted to hear this, that the, the airships could be a solution 
less emissions, and of course the vapor trails, and I know this audience knows all about this, so I, I won't add further, just that the pollution from airplanes is really an important factor. It's not something we can just ignore. And of course, the airships have a second advantage, and that's been talked about already in this uh, uh, meeting, which is real estate. You can have a very large uh, fuel tank on an airship and still have lots of room for cargo. So that's its really big advantage. Weight, of course, is an issue, as it is with all avi aviation, so it has to still be light, but it can be very big without being a problem. What we have here is a picture of the Pathfinder 1. Uh, this is uh, the first day. It was taken outside the hangar. Uh, they have an agreement with the FAA to do 50 uh, flights now. Uh, this is uh, an airship that was built by, well, four, I guess you could say, uh, Sergey Brin, the co-founder of Google. So it's his own private money, not Google per se, uh, that's doing this. Uh, it's a rigid airship. And this is a really important point. What you're looking at is the very first rigid airship in 86 years. There's been lots of airships still around, blimps and what have you, but not ones that are rigid. And a rigid airship, of course, has a frame, and it has gas cells inside, or half a dozen, or 12 of them, I guess, or more, and they're at atmospheric pressure inside the hull of the, of the, uh, of the airship. Uh, the biggest advantage, of course, is that Rigid airships scale up. Uh, the difficulty with blimps is the biggest one we've ever seen would only lift about 15 tons. And uh, in fact, I think that one, the biggest one the Navy built, actually burst in air because, again, the stress on that envelope. And again, your engineering audience, you all know what hoop stress is. It's hoop stress that limits the size of a blimp. You just can't get that much greater diameter without having a problem. They're very good for small size. Bridges aren't, because you have to get big enough to get over the dead weight of the, of the craft before you get any useful lift. But they can get much bigger. Uh, the historic limit is about 70 tons of lift by the Hindenburg. Uh, that was really a function of a number of things, leakiness of the gas cells and so on. But that size of airship, we usually think about 50% dead weight. It would lift 100 tons today. So an 800 foot long airship. And these economies of size are important. The, the Pathfinder 1 is 400 feet long, it lifts 10 tons. If you go to 600 feet, you're lifting 30 tons. At 800 feet, you're lifting 100 tons. And beyond that, we're not certain. But obviously, they can get bigger still, and they will, which is necessary if you're going to compete with cargo jets, by the way. So looking at this, Professor uh, King, who was the advisor to the British government for many years on science, he basically came forward and said, maybe we should be considering changing conventional air freighters out for airships. Uh, he didn't uh, think they would take over that much of the market, I guess. Uh, but essentially what you can see if you look at the choices over the ocean, uh, right now we've only got very fast and very expensive or we have very slow and very cheap. And the airships are sort of in between there and able to give us a, a mode in behind that could do things. And looking at this from an economic perspective, obviously the cargo jets are very expensive, airships very low in terms of distance, but in terms of time, it's the other way around. So part of the issue comes back to, well, what's the value of your time? If your time is very valuable, if it's a liver transplant, it better go in a cargo jet or a passenger jet, maybe. Um, if it's textiles, it maybe isn't that important. So it depends a lot on what is the value of time for the, for the business. I did some work on this some years ago looking at perishables and shelf life. And what is a shelf life? So people, we're the most perishable. We're going to go in a jet airplane. There's no question of that. We're not going to worry about an airship. Um, seafood and flowers, uh, some of these things have to go at that speed. But if you get into the area in between that dotted line, that's the missing piece for cross-ocean transport. Um, you never see uh, tomatoes from Australia or peaches from Europe 
for products like that. And it just takes too long to get here, and therefore uh, we don't even consider that. In fact, you know, someone pointed out to me the other day about getting blueberries from Peru, which, yeah, they're quite nice, you know, and, and interesting. A lot of fruit coming out of Peru, all by air and all by cargo jet, as far as I can tell. Well, uh, the marine obviously can deal with some of these other things. And then we have this crossover plate. Uh, fashion goods are a really interesting one because the way it works is if you have something that's a hot selling item and you try to get it by ship, by the time it arrives, the season will have passed. So you miss the opportunity. So that's why you need that speed to bring it in. And of course, they, we do see textiles and fashion goods moving by air for that very reason. We developed this idea in terms of how much freight would move <coughs> from other modes of transport to airships if airships were available. And we look at this in terms of value and also volume and time. And this pyramid, of course, if it's very dense and very viable, it's going to go by air. Uh, again, if, if it's worth its weight in gold, it will go by, by jet. Uh, there's a group down below called Sea Air. And for example, you can see the ship leaving out of, I think it's Hong Kong, going over to Dubai, and then it gets onto an airplane and goes into, into uh, um, Schiphol in Holland. Uh, that sort of system uh, cuts down the time from 35 to 40 days to 14 days. And the cost is about two thirds of the cost of air freight. So for some goods, we already have this effort to try and you know, get the, uh, the cost down and, and not too much time. Uh, and then, of course, the sea containers. Some goods that just can't stand the, the cost, they have to move by sea container. The airship would have a fairly big market. It would take the high value freight off the containers, and I think it would take away all the uh, sea air freight and it would eat into some of, if not a lot of the dedicated cargo freight as well. So it's a, it would be a very big market for cargo airships. In looking at this, one of the things we have to recognize is that you don't want to take airships over mountains. The higher you go, the less you can lift. So you don't want to have to go over the Rocky Mountains. But in the case of Canton, you'll notice that, Phil, that's just right there in Winnipeg. So I just put that in the heart of uh, where we're talking about. So you could get to Asia or you could get to Europe. Uh, you don't have to cross the Rockies. Um, now your trip would likely be more like this. You're, you'd follow the, the Mackenzie uh, River and out through the, uh, the Bering Strait and around crossing over oceans, uh, generally speaking. Uh, freight could come in or go out and of course could also be distributed to the south. Again. With airships, they're generally going to be more expensive than road transport. And everything starts on a truck anyway. So you probably position these gateways sort of at the end of where the convenience is for the roads. You bring them that far, then you transload them onto airships and off they go to destination. Of course, I also have an interest in the idea of food movements. And we would be able to bring in food to Canada from South America, many parts of South America, Chile would be about a three-day trip uh, to get here. That'd be pretty fast for most fruit. Um, but all of Central America, Brazil, would be available as well. So we could have a lot of products coming in. And we'd have a lot of products going back out. Airships always have to have a load. If you don't have cargo, you have to put ballast water on. So there's always a demand for products. So we could move things that we sell in abundance or produce in abundance. Um, protein products, pork, beef, dairy products maybe, uh, and a few other things going back down. These are pictures of airships. Uh, the, the one you've seen, the Pathfinder 1, which is the most advanced. Uh, the one by Flying Whales has received a lot of attention because of the connection with Quebec. So they've invested in this airship's development as well. So those are probably the two that are furthest along. But there's others that are also coming. The, the one at the very top is, is Russian technology. Uh, the company left Russia and, and headquartered it itself over in Israel, and they've produced aerostats. And if they ever get the funds, they'll build that uh, vehicle called the Atlant, uh, which they've been wanting to do for at least a decade or more. 
Uh, the one in the middle is a British design, all aluminum. Uh, these are all rigid airships. And then we have some non-rigid airships. Again, if you have the double load, you can kind of cheat the hoop stress and get up to maybe 20 tons, maybe a bit beyond that. So it, you know, we wait to see. But a 10-ton lift one, the one in the, the third one down, Airlander, is going into production. And it's going to be used for passenger moves as much as anything else, but it could be freight. So what are the unresolved problems? Again, this is a research <coughs> entity. So what are the things that you might want to work on or think about if you're interested in, in airships? And these were some of the items that were never really properly dealt with, weather forecasting being one. And one of my colleagues said they, they must have been tremendously brave, these airship captains. 15 minutes after they left their base, they had no idea what was out in front of them. And in fact, if you look at the history of airships, virtually all the accidents were involving weather. So weather forecasting is going to make this whole industry a whole lot uh, safer. Uh, static electricity. Again, what brought down the Hindenburg was static electricity. At least that was the spark. Uh, and today, we understand this quite well. Static electricity, by the way, also brought down a lot of airplanes before we figured out how to handle that. So it wasn't just airships. Structural failure, uh, another issue that it's hard to remember that all these rigid airships built before the Second World War were built without the benefit of a strain gauge. The strain gauge wasn't invented until 1938, and the Hindenburg went down in 37. So they were built with nothing more than a slide rule. So you can imagine trying to guess where the stresses were accumulating to be able to, uh, to build an airship of that size and, and do some. Of course, we're not going to worry about that today. Hydrogen gas, ground handling. I'm going to come back and talk about these. So the first one about weather, because the question did come up in my conversations. Of, well, you know, if you've got a headwind, what do you do about that? And the answer is, well, the future of airships is not going to be a straight path. Uh, you can see number one, which is the straight path would take uh, some, uh, what was it, 64 hours? Uh, they had measured, this was from uh, Vancouver, or Seattle, over to, I think it was Korea, is where they had the, uh, the end point. But if you have the weather patterns, you might burn a bit more fuel to get into position to get a tailwind, and then that'll sweep you along. I mean, it's something that you can't really do with an airplane quite the same or maybe it doesn't have the same benefit. But for airships, there is a major benefit. And you know, they looked at the changing the, the, the direction, 59 uh, hours to go some 9,000 kilometers instead of what would be 64. Well, that adds up in terms of fuel and also, of course, in, in utilization. So uh, this is what's happening with our, our weather uh, problem. It could be a benefit. Uh, structural failures. As you can see, this is a famous accident in 1922, uh, 15 years ahead of the Hindenburg. This is what led to the ban on hydrogen in the US, and suddenly, or ultimately, it was rubber stamped into all the regulations around the world, including our own, uh, happened because of this accident. And it wasn't the accident per se. It wasn't hydrogen that caused the accident. It was actually the, they turned the airship too fast, and they broke it. And you can't turn airships too fast, just like a ship of the ocean. You can't do that. Uh, so this lost six controls. It goes flopping across the countryside, runs into high tension wires, bursts into flame, which is filled with gas, as well as being built of canvas and rope and wood and, and filled with hydrogen. Uh, everybody on board perished. The people who had been promoting helium were the actually the U.S. Uh, Department, the Bureau of Lands, they had established a small refinery in Oklahoma where they had the, the helium, and they wanted to protect that because there was no market for helium. What are you going to use it for? And they worried the U.S. government was going to close their, their refinery, so they wanted to do something about this. So they had this accident. They ginned up the press and told them that if only this airship had been filled with helium, all these people would have been saved. And they, of course, 
at that time, nobody knew very much about chemistry of these gases anyway, so it got wide publication. And they ultimately got a presentation in the US Congress. And they came in with two balloons, one with hydrogen labeled and one with helium. And they put the burning flint in, into the helium and it goes out. Now, if the hydrogen's got more than 75% purity, the flint would go out there too. But if it's contaminated, it goes off like a shotgun or a howitzer, and it rattled the windows in the Congress. And at that point, they said, that's it. No more hydrogen in military airships in the US. They passed that decision. So that's the science behind the ban on hydrogen. Nothing more than that. And of course, ultimately, after the Second World War, those military regulations got put into civilian use. And then those civilian regulations became the standard around the world. So this is how, in Canada, we have a ban on hydrogen when we've never had an industry of airships. Uh, down below, you can see engineered structures. I don't think we're going to suffer any uh, structure failures anymore. There's the hydrogen up being except for lifting gas. I think one of the real problems was it is invisible, has no taste, you can't smell it. And so it's very scary to know that you have a gas that might burn, might explode, and you don't know if it's there. But today, for 182 pounds, you can buy this device off the internet that'll pick out parts per million. We know that hydrogen will only burn with a concentration of 4% or more in the air. It's actually hard to ignite. So as long as you have these kind of sensors around and you keep the area ventilated, you can never have a fire. Which, by the way, is why you never hear about a warehouse blowing up. But if you go to any of the warehouses that have electric to uh, forklifts, there's a big room someplace with a rack that's charging 12 volt batteries, big ones. And they produce a lot of hydrogen, just like a car battery does if you charge it by yourself. Well, you never hear about an explosion there because they have the sensors and they have ventilation. So as long as you can keep the, the space uh, free of a critical mass of hydrogen, there should not be a problem. Now, whether the regulators agree with that, that's another issue, but that's the case. Ground handling, this is one that was never really uh, solved. And that's a very famous picture uh, of the airship, I think that was the Graf Zeppelin actually, that uh, got caught in a wind and it flipped upside, straight up and down. It came down again slowly, it didn't damage anything, although I guess it spilt the coffee for sure. Uh, one of the problems with airships is they've got two forms of instability, in, unstable in yaw and unstable in pitch. So in order to get around that, the, the Zeppelin company created, which you can see at the very uh, bottom of the picture, a railway track with a car on it that you could hook onto the tail fin. So they attach it to the mass, and then the airship, as it moved around, it would move on the track that would hold it down and also reduce the, the speed with which it moved. Because they had a problem just you know, putting on fuel and other things. Uh, this worked, but it's not very practical uh, for a number of reasons. You'd have to have a different track sort of for every airship you'd have, size. And of course, we're looking at the north, and we're saying, well, that's not going to work for the north. So what are we going to do? How do we deal with ground handling? Because you have to be safe. You know, it's not like any tolerance for any kind of accident at all anymore. Somebody's injured, there's an, a study done. Somebody's killed, and your project shut down. So there can be no room for error. Well, we've come up with this idea, which is to have a rotating base, essentially a very large turntable. Uh, the airship will come down, land vertically on the turntable, and then be secured there. And the turntable will turn automatically if the wind changes, because the nose always has to be kept into the wind. If you're on the turntable and the airship moves, you move with it. So there's not going to be any risk to the people. And the only risk is getting on and off the turntable which you can do with an electric eye and a brake of some sort to, to do that. So this is our proposal for how we're going to go forward. And we want to build these kind of bases right across the north for airships, but also, I think, for long distance, any kind of airship, this idea uh, could work and is necessary. 
because the airship industry, I think, has done itself a disservice. You know, I've seen lots of people say, oh, don't worry about that, we just land anywhere. Well, you might be able to land anywhere, but if you're doing regular cargo deliveries, the third day in the muddy field might be your last day. Because you have to have handling equipment. If you're going to bring 60 or 100 tons in, how do you handle that? Uh, where is handy equipment do you have? And, and you have to have speed, you know, time to move these things on and off. Um, the airship shouldn't be on the ground more than an hour, you know, just like an airplane. You want to keep it in the air and keep it moving and, and keep the uh, uh, revenue still coming. And of course, if you have a prepared base, then you can have a, a store of ballast water, which is the best thing for your, to equal out the weight. You can pump it quickly and it's very divisible so the first thing you do after landing is you fill your ballast tanks full, so it's nice and heavy, unload your cargo, put on whatever you're gonna take with you, and then release the ballast until you hit the right weight and off you go. So uh, if you have a prepared base, you can do that. The other thing we've talked about, and George, I don't see him in the audience, I know he gave a presentation on the first day. We've been talking about this notion of cold weather testing. And again, we want to use the airships in the north. And if you don't have a way of proving that they're safe, will any agency give you permission to use them? They have to have a spot. And where can you do that? You have to have a protected site. So we've been working with uh, Thompson, Manitoba, with the idea of doing a cold weather testing to add the things they're already doing. They've already an established uh, location. And, and as George pointed out, it isn't just it's cold, they've got the right kind of cold, because you get the right kind of snow conditions and others to test many things. And as you can see on the uh, side of the uh, screen, these are all airship companies that want to work in the cold, so okay, let's have a place that we can do the testing and, and make that happen and, and go from there. Uh, this is what we have in mind. It doesn't have to be this way, but there are four of these open pits that are just the right shape. If we convert those into hangars for a cargo airship, that might be a lower cost solution. If not, then you have to build one above ground. But at least there's a possibility that it could be repurposed. So in my conclusions, uh, first of all, the you know, jet passenger transport, that shaped the world. It really, it changed everything. I wouldn't be here speaking to you if I had to come by a bus. I'd still be on the way to get here from Winnipeg and Phil would be beside me. Uh, you know, you have to have jet aircraft to get around. And I think in many cases, maybe this push to try and reduce the emissions of passenger jets is a little bit wrong-headed. I mean, I realize that they do cause uh, damage, and there's quite a bit, but they're a really critical element, and I don't see an easy or a good replacement for it. And some of the solutions I do see are really expensive. It would make air travel uh, pretty prohibitive for a lot of people and have a lot of impacts. As an economist, I say, well, you know, why wouldn't we take the things we could change uh, easier? Uh, heating, for example. Did I talk to you about a carve out? Oh, yeah, I didn't say about that. Anyway, uh, maybe we need a carve out for jet airplanes and focus on reducing other forms of carbon emissions instead and have the priority, because we're never going to go to zero carbon emissions. That's not the idea. We're just going to reduce them down to a level where that it's acceptable. Um, well, the real costs are being recognized, obviously, and you can see they're, they're scrambling. But the biggest problem, in my view, is the cargo jets. They're the most polluting and the least necessary. If you can cross the Pacific uh, Ocean in 64 hours, or let's say, let's be generous and say three days, well, that's fast enough for almost any cargo that has to move, uh, with the exception of, of the liver transplant. Uh, airships, they're going to be electric. They're all going to be electric. Uh, that's the much better system, and much better for the north, by the way, because uh, electric motors don't uh, act up quite as much as the other ones do, as engines. Uh, hydrogen is going to be a pivotal part of this. We all know that. Uh, there are no insurmountable barriers. There's no technical barriers to doing airships. In fact, Almost everything you need to build an airship, you can acquire in the existing aviation supply chain. You don't have to invent propellers or actuators or, or avionics or, or anything like that. 
The, the one thing that's a little bit tricky are the gas cells. But other than that, everything is basically available, just a matter of modification to, to put in for an airship. And of course, we're going to reduce the cost of air freight if we have this. We're going to see a lot more transport. I mean, this whole notion of, of food transport is one that I, I love because I'm so tired of buying tomatoes that look like tomatoes, but they don't taste like tomatoes. I want ones that taste like tomatoes, too. So this is my last slide. I really appreciate being invited to speak uh, to the Turnbull Lecture. I looked up Dr. Turnbull, a pretty impressive uh, individual, and what he was able to do. It was just remarkable. And I saw that this is from the, uh, I guess it's the Aviation Hall of Fame or whatever. They had this quote from his dear wife who advised him, don't for pity's sake let anybody know what you're doing or you'll be known as a flying machine crank. And I use this because I re remember the, the phrase that came from Mark Twain. And he said that any person with a new idea is a crank until it's proven, and then they're a visionary. So obviously, Mr. Turnbull was a visionary, and uh, we respect him for that. But I'd also say to everybody in the audience, don't be afraid of being thought of as a crank. If you don't be thought of as a crank, at least at some point, you're probably not doing enough uh, that's original and new to, uh, to, to justify where you are. So with that, I'll just say thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, uh, and I'm very willing to answer any questions anybody might have. And if anybody wants to share a cab to the airport with me, <laughs> I'm interested in that too. Uh, Barry, that's Malcolm Imre. Um, I just wonder if you want to just uh, expand a little bit on what you think um, uh, the Pathfinder One is going to show us over the over the next uh, year or so, uh, in in the context of of not only what you just talked about for um, for possibly a new um, air cargo market, but also more specifically for the northern air cargo uh, in, in Canada. How far is it going to help us get there? Well, I think it's a really important thing. Uh, the first is that you know a lot of people um, just don't believe that the airships actually will work, notwithstanding the fact they work 85 years ago and crossed oceans and did a lot of remarkable things given the technology of the day, there's been this doubt because there's been a lot of false starts. And you know, things that were tried like the cargo lifter, for example, and it failed and that probably set the industry back a good 15 to 20 years. The biggest problem with the airship industry has been a lack of investment. And the lack of investment is coming from a couple of sources. One, of course, is that doubt about, you know, will they really work? The other is, where is the availability of helium? Uh, if you have to use that, you know, we're slowly getting past that notion and, and more confidence that we can use hydrogen safely, which I think we can. Uh, we also, of course, are going to go to robotics. Ultimately, uh, these airships won't have anybody on board. So if that's the case, why would we worry about uh, whether it's helium or hydrogen at that stage? Uh, the big problem of investment has also been because there's been no government push for airships. Now, I know it may sound strange to you, but you know, in terms of transportation, it's always a partnership. Uh, the government produces the physical, long-lived, multi-use parts of infrastructure, and the private sector produces the vehicles and the short-lived uh, mobile bits of, of the technology. Well, if the government doesn't say anything about you know, airships, like it or not like it, there's, they create doubt. And if they aren't willing to put in the bases and the places for the airships to land, how does this industry emerge? Not only that, again, you may not be aware of this, but in Canada, no one in this country can become an airship pilot. There's no regulations to permit that to happen. And not only that, you can't even become a mechanic to work on an airship in this country because there's no regulations to allow that, not to even mention the idea of building an airship here. So the regulatory framework is lacking. And again, if you're an investor and you're looking at 
you know, should I invest in airships? Well, you know, what country would you go to? I don't think Canada would be the first one because, you know, we aren't prepared to even begin to have this industry, which is really quite sad. Um, with regard to the north, this is absolutely critical. Again, climate change is moving fast. Uh, we're seeing uh, already damage to existing infrastructure because of the more active uh, soils beneath the roads or airstrips. But for us, where we live, we're not too far away from the winter roads or the ice roads. And they have already lost half their season already by now. And this year, which is an El Nino year, you're probably going to see them in the paper because I got a feeling that they may get only a couple of weeks at the outside. And it isn't just milder temperatures, it's also those breaks in the winter when suddenly, you know, it's been above zero for a week. Well, the winter roads stop and it takes another week to get them back in action again. So the, and there's no good replacement for these roads. Uh, there, there's a very extensive network. In Manitoba, we have 2,400 kilometers of these roads built across lakes and muskeg and what have you. Ontario has 3,000 kilometers. You stitch those together, you get from Montreal to Vancouver. So imagine building a road every year of that distance, and then in the spring it melts away and you have nothing to show for it. But at least you could get the freight in. That's ending. Uh, there was a recent study uh, just last year that looked at climate change and the ice thickness on the lakes. And they're saying that if the temperatures get to 1.5 Celsius above the base, we're now about 1.3, uh, in the north, uh, the ice will not have a meter. And without a meter of ice, you can't take a tractor trailer over the lake. So it could be that soon that we're going to see it. So we need a, a solution. And we think the airships would be a, a very good solution. They don't disturb the ground. You could get year-round transport. Uh, a 30-ton lift airship, by the way, that's the next step for Sergi Brin. His first one is to this 10-ton lift airship is just a demonstrator to see how everything works. They're already building the 30-ton lift airship in Akron, Ohio. Uh, they've purchased the, the Goodyear hangar. So they're already underway. Um, it's going to show a couple of things. One is, at least I'm hoping, it sets off airship mania. Uh, that you know, People will say, well, oh, there's money to be made. Let's get into that. And especially you know, given the kind of benefits it could have in certain in markets. So that's what I'm hoping is the outcome, uh, is really to push people off this point of saying, well, Al, it might work, it might not work, we'll, we'll wait and see. Well, there'll be no more waiting and seeing, we'll be standing and watching. And, uh, and that's what uh, I hope happens. Well, if you don't start asking questions, I'm going to ask you questions. Oh, yes. So, from an engineering perspective, a lot of people think of airships and their uh, challenges with piping, uh, and that's something that the cargo jets can power through, uh, albeit with a lot more fuel. Um, what, what, are, what, are, uh, what are some typical engineering solutions to airships and how you would fix them? Well, it's a good question, and, and it really comes down to <coughs> you know, we've had a lot of experience since the Hindenburg in looking at this. You know, the, can you develop something that has less of the parasitic drag? Uh, I mean, they're, they're big and they're, they're <laughs> in diameter, uh, so you're going to get some, a lot of air resistance, and you're not going to go at uh, 800 kilometers an hour. Uh, but I think it can go somewhat faster. Uh, when I've looked at the economics of this, it's amazing how much more profitable an airship is, even just going 10 or 20 kilometers faster, because uh, you get so many more turns in the course of a year. So speed really does help. Uh, that 145 kilometer speed that was the old cruise speed of the Hindenburg, we're not sure if that was because that was as fast as they wanted to go to minimize fuel consumption, or it's as fast as the diesel engines they had, a long time ago diesels, that would push the airship, or that's as fast as they dared to move the airship given the airframe, which they didn't have good confidence uh, would hold up. So it could be quite possible that we could see an airship going 200 kilometers an hour. 
landfill, which would actually be very significant. Uh, and in fact, you could burn a lot more fuel and still be very economic to do that. Uh, one of the things that is being uh, worked on in Europe is the idea of covering that whole airship with solar panels, or actually a solar film. And uh, they're working on solar films now that are, are, in the lab at least, equal to the panels in terms of energy production, So, which is really pretty amazing. But if you have a, a solar film, then you just drive the airship as fast as you had the energy come in, and uh, whatever that would mean. Uh, obviously, you have to have batteries on board too, because you're not going to have 24-hour sun. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, this is one of the ideas that people have to, uh, to use. And so that would change the, the speed cost ratio quite a bit. Um, again, uh, how fast is necessary? You know, if you're only moving cargo, reliability is more important than speed. Uh, when you say you're going to be there, you, the shipper's expecting you, you better be there. And I think that was probably more the issue. But it's not the only one. I mean, ocean liners are a day or two, depending on the storm. So, uh, you know, it's not like uh, airships couldn't comp uh, uh, compete. Other questions? <coughs> well, thanks so much for a very insightful, I think, well-framed uh, talk, Barry. Um, Manitoba just got a new premiere. Yes. And uh, I think he's provided some directive on executing a northern airport strategy. And I think deep inside some of these legislative mandate letters, he's actually called for the creation of an airport at Wasagamac and some of these previously uh, neglected regions. Has, has airships been uh, discussed as part of uh, any of those chats or consultations? Please, you asked the question. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually speaking with the Minister of Transport on Monday uh, for Manitoba uh, to talk about this very thing. <coughs> and one of the difficulties with the, the gravel runways, as you probably are aware, uh, the length, of course, determines how big the airplane can be, and we don't have the uh, ability to move cargo jets on those. Um, it has to be something smaller. And you can only get in an airplane what you can get through the door. So, you know, there's still room for airships, even if they really advance the, uh, the, uh, the air bases uh, for uh, Manitoba. There's been talk of trying to turn those over to the First Nations to run them, which may or may not be good. I, I don't know, it's like handing somebody an anchor when they're drowning, I think, because those aren't very profitable airports, uh, so I don't know how that's going to work. Uh, well, Sigamac is one place that had no airport. In that case, there's three communities, uh, Garden Hill, St. Teresa Point, and Wasigamac, and there's one airport on an island. <coughs> Why you put an airport on an island, I'll never quite understand, because if break up and freeze up, you, you're not going to have any service. And then, of course, if the island also means that you can't really get any longer uh, in several of those places. So you know, I'm not sure why they did that uh, when they originally did it, but um, there will always be a role for airplanes. You know, relax everybody who's in the building airplanes. There's going to be a role for airplanes. Airships aren't going to take over the world. Uh, they're another mode of transport. I think they can do really well on the cargo side. I think they can do certain areas uh, that are really interesting. Um, you know, Flying Whales has an airship that might be ideal for moving wind turbine blades. Um, it has the, the right sort of characteristics for that. Others that would be very good for tourism. And imagine, you know, you can fly and look down on the whales or the polar bears and not disturb them because you're just a, a cloud. So, you know, there's markets for that sort of airship. And, and some have this idea of a, a mobile crane a sort of a lenticular-shaped airship uh, to, to be used. So when the dust settles, there's going to be a half a dozen different airships. I think the long-distance cargo airships will likely be rigid, cigar-shaped airships because they need the aerodynamics and they need the speed and, and they need the size. And that's probably the biggest category of airships, but these others are also going to be there. And the advertising blimps aren't going away, by the way. Uh, you can still see those in the air. So uh, there's a, a lot of different markets. <coughs> I guess I'd say for Canada, you know, this is a huge opportunity for us. Uh, we really need a transport for the north. Where most of the airships have been researched in Europe and the US, they don't need airships, they've got roads everywhere. 
But in this country, 70% of the landmass has no roads and no hope of getting roads. And yet we have people there, we have resources, um, critical minerals. Uh, there is one mine in northern Quebec that would take the first airship will come. Uh, they have a, a deposit that's 240 kilometers from the railhead and to build a road it's somewhere around three quarters of a billion dollars. Well, nobody can afford to do that. And that's if they get permission to do it because you have to get over the environmental issues and, and other land claims issues and so on, even just to do that. So, you know, they would take an airship right away. That one mine would need seven 30-ton lift airships. And there's lots of deposits of that size around that, that could be served. So, you know, we're not talking about a couple of airships solving the problem. This is an industry that's going to have a lot of production. I'll even go so far as to say, and I can predict this because it'll occur after I'm long gone, only the safe kind of prediction you can give, but I sincerely believe that when this industry matures, it will be as big as the fixed wing airship or airplane industry is today because there's that much freight to move around and, and the ability to move it would be so much more uh, desirable in terms of environment and cost uh, that we won't use airplanes for that anymore. So for those of you who are young, this is your opportunity. Think airships. Hey Barry, just had a question. If, so <coughs> aside from public uh, funding for this sort of stuff, I assume private funders have been uh, approached about it, including other shipping companies and whatnot. What's their main reason for not wanting to get into it, considering the, the potential market share that it could hold? You know, it, it's a question I've asked directly. I, I managed to trap the president of Hud Bay Mines at the PDAC meetings in his booth, and he couldn't get away, and so I asked him, and I was amazed how much he actually knew about airships. You know, and, and I said to him, you know, well, you know, there's so much risk in mining, like out of all the claims, how many get drilled, and of those that get drilled, how many end up turning into a mine, and there's so much spending on, on all this, you know, a huge amount of risk, you know, so why wouldn't you invest in airships? Because I asked him if he would, he said, oh, no, never. <laughs> I said, well, well, why not? He said, well, we understand about digging things out of the ground, but we don't know anything about flying them through the air. But as soon as there's an airship, we will use it, is his command, his comment. And I think that's, you know, very typical for a lot of the possible shippers is, yeah, they would love to have the service, but they don't want to take the risk and invest in it. And it's like everybody's standing with their, their arms folded, waiting for somebody to do something. You know? And then once this happens and somebody does something, then everybody will jump on board. I think that there is a need for government to lead on this. And especially when it comes to the North. As I would say, even Sergi Brin, in his most magnificent uh, uh, humanitarian view, isn't going to spend a billion dollars to provide airships to serve the remote populations that we have in the north in Canada. And if you look at those populations at all, I know, Malcolm, you've been to the north. Many people here probably have. You know, the first thing you get is sticker shock when you're trying to buy food. You know, it's three times whatever you'd pay here. And the houses are in deplorable shape and overcrowded. I mean, the conditions are really, uh, how should I put this, uh, uh, bad for our reputation, I guess as a country, is that we are not looking after people up there very well. And when I talk to the people in the North, they say, you know, things are worse today than they were 20 years ago. And that's notwithstanding the fact that we're spending an enormous amount of money to sustain those populations. Uh, the government spends about $130 million every year just to subsidize the cost of transporting food to the North. That one item, there's $130 million. And if you go to a place like Iqaluit, everything you see is all built with uh, taxpayer money. So we're already spending huge amounts of money to sustain these populations, and we're getting no progress, just like those ice roads. We're not getting anything, any progress. We're just sustaining what we've had because you know, we aren't moving on to what could be the solution. And I always say to people, you know, if existing technology would do it, well, there'd be no problem. We'd have done it. So we can't 
just think about existing technology, we have to look at something that isn't here now. Uh, and I said the, the, the closest uh, suggestion I've had over the last 20 years, I've been at this a long time. Nobody's tapped me on the shoulder and said, ah, oh, Dr. Prentice, forget those airships, I got a better idea, except for one person. And he said, maybe we could just have a giant catapult and we just fling <laughs> things into the north. And that's about as realistic as we have as an alternative. So, you know, if we don't do airships, and I ask you, then what? Because we just simply can't abandon the population, of, and we can't abandon the North. You know, it, it is part of our, our nation, and, and we need to actually serve it properly. And we won't do it with existing technology. Well, I think as a catapult, I probably lost all my credibility, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> The, uh, no further questions? Thank you so much, everyone. I want to make sure you <laughs> <laughs>